Father in heaven, all week we have been singing in our series, How Beautiful You Are. And we are so thankful, particularly as we come into these sacred Sabbath hours, to know that you are beautiful, you are attractive, and you have invited us into your presence. And Father, it's not that you tolerate us, it's not that you put up with us, it's that you want us to come into your presence. And Father, in worship and in study and in fellowship, we enter in to your presence right now. Father, may this be not just an ordinary Sabbath. Father, we want something more than that. We want it to be an extraordinary Sabbath. So be with us tonight. We've turned our attention to you in music and in worship. And now as we turn our attention to you in the text, as we think, as we ruminate on your goodness, May we not only sing, but may we now say in our hearts and in our minds, you are beautiful, you are awesome, you are worthy to be praised and worthy to be worshiped. Father, be with us now is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone that thinks that God is beautiful say amen Amen and amen. Thank you guys. That was great. Beautiful. All right, good evening, Andrews University. Oh, come on, good evening, Andrews University. All right, can we give a big thank you to the music team? That was incredible, beautiful, yes. That was awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have been on a journey this week. Our week of prayer series has been titled Beautiful and Believable, very good. And uh, we've been sort of going on a journey through the eyes to some significant degree of my 19, 20, 21 year old punk rock self. And we've described that journey moving through the various obstacles that were seemingly standing in the way of giving God a fair hearing. And beginning to some degree yesterday where we talked about the cross and especially this morning, we've, we've come up against that that barrier, that obstacle that presents itself as an insuperable obstacle for many. And uh, for those of you that are uh, of a faith community or a faith family and, and you've been associated with Christian things and worship things and biblical things for a long time, this obstacle might be something that you've made peace with early on. It might be something you've not thought much about, but I can assure you of this that for people outside of a faith community, outside of a Christian or a religious context, this is the preeminent question that faces them and that frankly presents itself as an obstacle to faith. With that in mind, we're going to do something tonight that's a little different, and I'm super excited about it. Um, In just a moment here, I'm going to invite my friend and seminary professor and author, Dr. John Peckham, up. But before we do that, in fact, just come up now, John. Just come on up. Let's give him a hand. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Um, So, John, first of all, let's just start with a little bit of uh, who are you? A lot of people here would know who you are. I know who you are, but who is John Peckham, Dr. John Peckham? Uh, I'm a professor at the seminary, as David just said, and uh, my wife's name is Brenda. My son is Joel, my pride and joy. Okay. And I love Jesus. Amen. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, I was just over at their house this evening, and your wife makes a mean sun-dried tomato pasta. I, I can confirm this. Um, so, John, you teach at the seminary, but in addition to being a teacher, you're also an author. And um, I've got two books here, one that you are the author of. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, titled The Odyssey of Love, Cosmic Conflict, and the Problem of Evil. Uh, But also this book, of which you are one of four authors, I mentioned this this morning, um, Four Views of God's Emotions and Suffering, and you take one of four positions here. Now, I'm going to put a quotation up on the screen here that I actually began with this morning. This is a tweet that Neil deGrasse Tyson, well-known astrophysicist, uh, tweeted earlier this year, and, and it's difficult to see it there. That's a screenshot of the tweet, but here it is. He says, the universe is blind to our sorrows and indifferent to our pain. Have a nice day. Right? And here he's echoing the sort of secular mantra, there is no God, there is no superintending benevolence. And my question for you, and I I said this morning, John, one of several questions I'm going to ask you, 
I'm going to ask you some tough questions. Is that all right? Do I have your permission to do that? Yes. Um, you've done a lot of thinking about this, a lot of writing about this. Your most recent book was published by Baker. I want to start by asking this question. When very intelligent, very accomplished people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and others like him say, yeah, the universe is indifferent to our sufferings, to our pain, and we respond as Christians, no, that's not true. Here's my question. Can we intellectually stand on safe ground or are we just playing sort of a kind of fairy tale game that we tell ourselves in settings like this, in institutions like this, in places like this, that there's a really good God out there, or are we, is it real? Can we actually, real talk now, can we believe both in the reality of suffering and in the goodness of God? That's my first difficult question for you. And, and speak right into the microphone. Yeah, yeah. So I believe that we can, with both conviction and sincerity, affirm that God is love, God is entirely good, all-powerful, and omniscient, and yet there is evil in the world. Now, we need to recognize at the outset that that's a, it's a very difficult conversation to have, a very difficult kind of problem. And there's no amount of uh, philosophical discussion or even theological discussion that can actually assuage the lived suffering, the actual evil that people experience. Only God can heal what's broken, mm. and he will. So we need Amen. to make a distinction at the outset between that and what we're talking about now, the philosophical problem of evil, this question of how can I actually consistently affirm that God is love and only wants what is best for you and me and yes. for everyone in spite of all the evil in the world? And this is, there's a particular form of this problem called the logical problem of evil, now, how to reconcile those things that God is entirely good, all so, power. Let me just stop you on that, John. So you're saying there's a logical problem that we're dealing with here, which is can we affirm two seemingly mutually exclusive ideas right. Number one, that God is good and all-powerful and that suffering is real. So there's a lot seeming logical dilemma there. Maybe belief in God is illogical. Is that true? This is the argument that philosophers made for quite some time. And in more recent decades, the, even atheist philosophers have agreed that that particular form of the problem has been resolved. And it's been resolved by the work of Alvin Plantinga. He came up with something called the free will defense, uh, he's not actually the one who came up with the free will argument, but he articulated it in such a philosophically rigorous way that even the vast majority of atheist philosophers admit that the logical problem of evil has been resolved. And basically his argument goes like this. Uh, those the premises of the problem of evil, that God is entirely good, that God is all-powerful, and that God is all-knowing, and yet evil exists, that some have argued are actually contradictory. He says they're not contradictory mm. if there is another factor, another premise. So if God decided that all, things being, all other things being equal, it is better for creatures to have moral freedom, the kind of freedom necessary for love, okay. than to not have that kind of freedom. And God grants creatures that kind of freedom, which means they have the freedom to actually do otherwise than he wants, to actually do evil. If that kind of freedom is necessary for some greater good love or something else, then it's, and if God grants that kind of freedom consistently, then it's not up to God anymore whether creatures choose to exercise their free will to bring evil into the world. And if mm. that's the case, then all of these premises can be reconciled together. Okay, so you said something there that might have gone right by some of the people, but I, I just want to make sure I've heard you correctly. You said that even the majority of atheist philosophers have read Plantinga's work and said, okay, fair point. There's no necessary logical contradiction between the aff affirming that God is good and the existence of evil in the world. The logical problem of evil has been surmounted and that's been conceded even by those that might have formerly held to that position. Okay, so here's the follow-up question on that. You made a distinction in the first part of your answer that we're talking about two things here, the philosophical problem of evil and then, did you call it the experiential problem? Yes, yeah, that's one way to refer to it. Okay, and so what about the experiential problem of evil? Clearly, that's not been resolved uh, because there is considerable evil and suffering and pain in the world. So is Plantinga's uh, victory a pyrrhic victory? Is it not really helpful? Uh, I don't think so. So, 
uh, even some of the philosophers that have said that his argument works for the logical problem of evil, it's true the atheist philosophers still think there is a problem of evil that is very serious. And they typically call that the evidential problem of evil or sometimes the probability problem of evil. And that problem is, okay, maybe it's logically possible that there's this kind of God who exists and there's evil in the world. Okay. But it's highly improbable, they say, that this kind of God exists given the kind and amount of evil in the world. And that is the problem that they typically press now in the discussion. Now, there's more than one way mm. to respond to that problem. Uh, one of the ways to respond to it, and probably uh, any reply to the problem of evil at some point or another gets to this point in the discussion. Okay. One way to reply is to recognize just how little we know. Uh, okay. So if God is entirely good, and if God is omniscient, then he has reasons for acting the way that he does and refraining from acting in cases where we, we might think that he should act or intervene. And the question is, why should we expect to be in a position to know what God's reasons are? And it doesn't follow from the fact that we don't know what God's reasons are. That he doesn't, that have, he reasons. doesn't have any reasons, right? Did uh, everybody get that? The fact that we don't know what those reasons are doesn't mean that there are no reasons. Right. Okay, keep going. Yeah, so one, of the, one philosopher calls this a no-seem argument that the atheists make, right? And so just because uh, there's, I guess, in the Midwest, some tiny flying insects that some refer to as no seems mm. They say just, they're so little you can't see them. But just because you don't see them, it doesn't mean they're not there. Just because you're not aware of what good reasons God has for acting the way he, he does, it doesn't follow that there aren't actually those kinds of reasons that he has. And I think already something like this kind of argument, uh, uh, at least the initial underpinnings of it, are found there even in Scripture. Even in the book of Job, you have this response okay. that God brings where he says, were you there when I created the world, right? Uh, do you know the answer to all these questions? Tell me if you know. And I, in one of the translations of Job 38, uh, it has God saying, why do you talk so much when you know so little? <laughs> right? well, we should probably stop talking right now. <laughs> Right? And, and the, the upshot of that is God has reasons, and even if we had no response to the evidential problem of evil, that, it wouldn't follow from that that there aren't good reasons. And if we know the living God and the living Jesus, then we have good reasons to believe in God even if we don't have answers to all of our questions. To specific instances of evil. Okay, so, so you're saying something there that I really want to tease out, and for me this is a big question that has been answered to my satisfaction, but I suspect that for some here this is still difficult for them to get their minds around. You talked about the free will argument that God grants people free will or what we might call agency to act in ways that are contrary to what God might desire. Is that what you're suggesting? Is that what Plantinga is suggesting? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so here's my question then. You mean to tell me that the omnipotent God of the universe who possesses all power, that's what the word omnipotent means, doesn't get his way? Why not? That, that seems incoherent. How can we affirm that an all-powerful God doesn't get what he wants. Yeah. So, of course, if God wanted to exercise all of his power, he could make everything occur in the way that he wants it to occur, right? That just follows from what it means to be all-powerful. Okay. However, there are some things that even an all-powerful being could not do, such as bring about two things that are actually impossible to occur together. So one of those two things, according to Plantinga, and I think he's right, and I think there's biblical grounds for this as well, uh, one of those things is you can't actually determine that someone love you freely. <laughs> okay, say that again a little slower this time. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot determine, that is, you cannot unilaterally make it the case that someone freely loves you. And the contradiction is in the determine, determine and, and freely. freely. So you're saying that not even God can do this, not because he lacks power, but because it's that's incoherent. To freely love, be determined, is like a square circle. It's nonsensical. Right, right. The way C.S. Lewis puts it, he says, if you want to affirm that God can go both give us free will and determine us to do everything, uh, you, can, you can add the words God can to the front of that sentence, but all you're doing is speaking nonsense, right? Okay. And so it's not a matter of God lacking any power. It's a matter of the actual uh, intrinsic necessity of what love is and what love requires. And if love actually requires the kind of freedom that, you, that it has to be either has to be freely given and freely received, then that requires the kind of freedom that can actually reject love. Wow. And if God is love, and if one way of thinking of evil, there's more than one way to define evil, of course, but if one way of thinking of evil is that which is against love, 
that which is against God, that which is against what God really wants. If that's one definition of evil, then the very uh, existence of love granted to creatures, the ability to love, requires the possibility that they will misuse their freedom and do evil. The Mm. possibility, not the actuality. Nobody had to exercise that freedom, but there has to be the possibility for creatures to exercise that freedom. And God didn't have to grant that kind of freedom, but if he wants to have creatures who can enjoy his love and freely love one another and bask in his love for eternity, then that kind of freedom is necessary. Woo! Can the church say amen? amen? Now, I want to press you a little bit more on this, and I hope you don't mind. There's a passage of Scripture, it might be in John 7 or Mark 7, somewhere in there that says that the scribes and the Pharisees rejected the will of God not having been baptized by John, right? So God had a will. He sent out John the Baptist, and he wanted people to hear the preaching of John the Baptist and repent. And the text says that the scribes and the Pharisees on this occasion and this day did not respond to the preaching of John the way that God intentioned, right? So this is your argument, basically, right? That, That God had a will and they had a will. So here's my question. You mean to tell me that finite man, the scribes and the Pharisees in that case, and let's be honest, it doesn't just happen 2,000 years ago. In my life, and I assume in your life, we can actually thwart, we can defeat the will of God in our lives? Is that possible? So here we have to make another distinction, Okay, right? We have to make a distinction between what God ideally desires, what, what He ideally wills. And if God gives us the kind of freedom to love or not love, to do things He doesn't want, then that ideal will of God can and has been thwarted, right? So God's ideal will is that there's no evil, that there's only an eternity of harmony, and one day he will restore the entire universe to that eternity of harmony. Amen. That is the good news. But that God's ideal will has already been undermined because creatures have misused their freedom to do evil. Mm. But there is another kind of God's will. It's referred to in different ways, but I refer to it as God's remedial will uh, from the word remedy where God is remedying the situation, okay. where God actually takes into account all the decisions of creatures, all the free decisions, without determining any of them, and he adds to that his own good decisions to bring about the best outcome that he can, given all of those bad decisions, which eventually will lead to an eternity of bliss and harmony. So in that sense, God's will cannot be thwarted. Wow. God wins the cosmic conflict, and uh, everyone who is in Christ enjoys eternal bliss, eternal love for all eternity. And everyone one day, even though we have questions remaining now, will recognize fully and freely that God is entirely righteous and just and loving in everything that he has done. Can the church say amen? John, you, you seem to be really smart. <laughs> this, the, you, this seminary professor thing might be just the right spot for you. Um, A question on that. So you're making a distinction between God's ideal will, which was that there would never be evil, there would never be the misuse of freedom, and God's, you called it, remedial will, where God sort of bakes into the decisions that He's doing the bad decisions that have been made. So here's a pointed question. How can we then be sure that God will be ultimately triumphant and successful and that this won't just perpetuate? Right? If God can be thwarted in the four instances, in my life, in your life, in the scribes and Pharisees, all of us know that, well, then how do we know that God will be finally victorious? What changes to bring about the final transition toward this eternal victory and not just these little temporary setbacks that God's will is experiencing? Right. So part of what the Bible teaches is not just that God is all-powerful, not just that He is entirely good and all-loving, but that He is also all-knowing. He is omniscient. He is infinitely wise. So he can know with certainty and have the perfect plan for bringing history to its fruition in a way that not only resolves the problem of evil in a way that every mind in the universe will recognize that he is just and loving, but in a way that evil will never arise again. And he can ensure that with absolute certainty because of his infinite wisdom. How? How does he do that? How does he ensure that? Well, one way... The idea that evil will never rise again, that we won't have a rerun or a sequel. How? 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 So the way that we can know it is by having confidence in the fact that God knows it. Right? How does so He know it? If God knows something to be true, well, He knows all of history, including the future. So He has absolute foreknowledge of everything that will occur and will not occur, including the, the rising of evil. But also in uh, something that Adventists call the Great Controversy, often in literature called the Cosmic Conflict, through this Cosmic Conflict, the universe is inoculated against evil. 
so that evil will never rise again. The entire uh, horrendousness of evil will be manifest, and no one will ever again exercise their freedom to do uh, evil once again. No one will desire it. And this is what your book is about, Theodicy of Love. It's about how the cosmic conflict, what we call the great controversy, interfaces with God's bringing about the best possible outcome given the circumstances that free agents have made. Yeah? So far, so good? Yes. So on that then, there's this conflict. How is that sort of, is that new, is that something that Adventists bring to the table? Is that unique with us, this idea that there's a cosmic conflict? Or is that something that's believed by other Christians as well? So the idea is not there are unique elements to it, but the idea is not unique to us. It's uniquely essential to Adventist theology, I would argue. But it's not unique to us. There has, all, all the way from the Bible and even in the Christian tradition, there has been the belief in this idea of a battle between good and evil, between God and a creature who is named Satan and other fallen angels who have rebelled against God. And that is what we call the great controversy. Others refer to it as a cosmic conflict or a cosmic warfare. Uh, that is not unique. Uh, this is thoroughly taught all throughout Scripture. Unfortunately, uh, since uh, the Enlightenment, the so-called age of reason, mm. a lot of theological thinking just kind of ignores that because it's kind of embarrassing uh, in some particular kinds of academic contexts and in the secular Western world where the greatest trick the devil has pulled is to convince people he doesn't exist, right? And so in this context, many people don't, don't talk about it very much. Uh, and so they're typically looking for other uh, ways to explain the problem of evil. But it's not entirely unique to us in any way. So can we reasonably affirm in 2019 the existence of demonic creatures and, and a Satan-like figure? I mean, isn't that a bridge too far? I mean, we, we live in the modern world. This is 2019. We have iPhones, right? I mean, real, what's the response to that? What's the rational response to somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson or others like him who would say, demons, devils, you've got to be kidding? Yeah, it's a great question, and what you just described is very similar to the way that Rudolf Bultmann put it once. He says, now, now we have the wireless, by which he meant the radio. He's writing in the 40s. Uh, now we have the wireless, and we have science, and we can't believe in angels and demons anymore. We have to demythologize all of that. Um, but one thing Planninga says in this regard, this is the plausibility of problem, plausibility problem, excuse me. He says, plausibility is in the ear of the hearer. In other words, what is plausible or plausibly true depends on your other background beliefs. Okay. So if you accept a worldview that arises from the Bible, uh, you could not even read uh, even a few chapters from the book of Matthew without running into the cosmic conflict. Already th there in the temptation of Matthew 4, yep, yep. all the way through to the end, Jesus is combating these demons uh, all the way through. This yes. is just built into the story of the Bible. So anybody, and this is another question entirely, but anybody that already has confidence in the Bible or is at least willing to entertain, entertain the biblical worldview uh, on which Christianity is based, that is going to be part of the worldview, that there is this kind of a cosmic conflict. Now, apart from that, uh, there is the claim made in the secular Western world that these things are just unbelievable. Uh, but many scholars have pointed out that this is a rather ethnocentric claim. Uh, okay. Almost all people groups in history and still today believe in supernatural beings. It is only those in the supposedly enlightened West that some don't believe in them, although there's, of course, a recurrence of belief in spiritual beings even among us in the United States okay. and in the secular West. And so this so is it's a, a small of percentage of the world's population that actually deny. I mean, if you travel to many places in the world, there, there's animism and there's all kinds of an awareness of the evil. It feels to me, too, like we're a little, we're a little disingenuous about this because, like, when 9-11 happens and those towers come crumbling down and we're seeing a four instance right in front of us on the television, the, the news reporters are scrambling, they're looking for words, they're searching for words, people are jumping out of buildings, and the word evil is just being thrown around very easily, very readily. So it kind of feels like it's special pleading. We, we don't want to talk about evil, we don't want to concede that those things exist, and when we're confronted with it, then we're like, yeah, well, maybe. Is yeah. that the argument? Yeah, absolutely. And many, many even secular philosophers, when they're talking about some of the acutely horrendous evils in the world, they, ex they actually say there's nothing to call this kind of evil except demonic, even though they don't believe in personal That's demons. That's their word? That's their wording, yes. Demonic. Demonic. And in fact, there are many people who have made an argument with regard to the problem of evil. They have reversed it, and they say, actually, if you are coming from an atheist perspective, you have the problem of goodness. <laughs> In other words, why would there be good at all? I love it. And on what basis would you have any reason to think that anything is actually evil or intrinsically evil? The very naming of evil as evil okay. is a kind of transcendent claim. 
uh, which many yes. argue, uh, at least from a Christian perspective, is certainly grounded in the supreme being himself. In the character of God. So, it's, so you're saying there's some standard by which things like evil and things like good are measured. So there's not just the problem of evil, which is what we're talking about here in suffering and pain. There's the problem of goodness. Yes, yes, from the atheist perspective. Okay, last question I want to put to you, and I'm going to really maybe transition here insofar as it's possible, and I know you can do this. And this is what I'm going to talk about when we finish the interview here, John, but I want to hear your input on this. From your perspective, you're, you've spent a lot of time studying this question, these questions. You've written about it. Um, your book is incredible. I've read it twice. Um, here's the question I've got for you. What is your view? You've just recently written a book on the doctrine of God. You've done a lot of thinking about this. How can God relate experientially, emotionally, whatever the language is we want to choose there, to the kind of pain and suffering that we feel? Or is He not able to enter into that world? He can view it like an aquarium and say, oh, that's really too bad. But, but does God feel in any way what we feel? And if He does, how do we know that? Yeah, yeah so there, there are some theologians who think that God cannot experience emotions, cannot actually enter into a kind of relationship that actually affects him. But the God of the Bible from beginning to end is a God who not only creates the world freely, he doesn't have to, he creates the world freely out of love, mm. but he also freely opens himself up to being affected by that world. Wow. And affected by the world in a way that actually causes him the most suffering of all. Okay. Because. Help us out with that. So if, if you're a parent, and I know you are, when, when your child suffers... I talked about this this morning. You suffer too. Yes, true. And everyone, every creature, is a child of God. Yes. And God identifies himself with us. Ultimately, he does it in the incarnation. But even apart from that, he takes on the entirety of the suffering of the world. And every time we suffer, he suffers with us. So he is not a distant God who is far removed. Mm. And the Bible just teaches this all the way through. He is the one who carries our burdens. He is the one who suffers for our iniquities. Yes. And this is, of course, supremely manifest at the cross. And this is actually the ultimate answer to the problem of evil before the end, before, before God comes again and reveals to us all the things we do not yet know. And that is to look at the suffering God of the cross. Yes. Because a God like that can be trusted. The one who willingly goes to the cross and gives himself for us. He did not have to do that. He didn't have to even create this world, yes. let alone continue to bear with this world, let alone open himself up to being affected by the world. Wow. But God has made the best interests of each one of us intrinsic, intrinsic to his own joy. Hallelujah. We just went to church. <laughs> Amen. John, I want, to, I want to thank you for coming. This is a, a wonderful thing that you've done for us. It's a brave thing that you've done for us. I, I love your mind. I've told you that before. I just want to affirm the work you're doing. Carry on, brother, and keep writing, keep teaching, keep preaching, and thank you for coming to be with us tonight. Thank you. Final word. Yeah. I was going to say thank you and vice versa. We love you and your mind, and we're so thankful for your ministry here this week. Thanks, John. Amen. Let's give him one more hand. Thanks, John. So we're going to pick up. I, I'm so thrilled with where John ended that. We're going to pick up exactly where John was going there at the end. We noted this morning that suffering is real and pain is real, and the ultimate question is, is our suffering meaningful or is it meaningless? We took a look at Scripture. We went specifically to Romans chapter 5, and we saw that Paul suggests this absolutely audacious idea that we should rejoice in our sufferings. The root word of rejoice, of course, is joy. And so Paul is inviting us here seemingly absurdly to, to take joy in our suffering and in our pain. And then Paul walks us through a, a kind of sequence. And he says, well, it goes like this. When you suffer and when you are in pain and when you face adversity, that requires endurance. 
And when you endure those hardships and hostilities, it actually turns you somehow wonderfully into a better version of yourself, a a more robust version of yourself, a more patient version of yourself. And when you begin to see that character transformation, it creates within you a hope and a longing that maybe it's all not just for nothing. Maybe there's some purpose here. Maybe there's some end here. Maybe God has some grand and beautiful end in mind. And Paul says that, it, that, that there is an end in mind, and that end is our understanding of the love of God. John then just ended on this incredible point about the points of access that God has to our pain and to our suffering, and that's what I want to talk about. The question that we mentioned this morning is, can God relate to our suffering and pain, or is He immune to such things? I wrote a book about this several years ago. The book is titled God in Pain. And when people bring that book to me, which they occasionally do, and say, Pastor Ashrick, would you sign my book? I say, I'd be honored to sign your book. That would be a a real privilege. And what I write in the the front cover of that book every time is this simple uh, dedication. I write these two words, the shortest verse in all of Scripture, right? John chapter 11, verse 35. I say, Jesus wept... And then this sentence, this whole book is about these two words. The idea that that Jesus wept, that he felt emotion, that, that he was moved by the scene there at the grave of Lazarus. But he wasn't just moved. And, and I have said before, if all we knew about God was that he had the capacity to weep, we would know enough to trust him. But he not only weeps at the, at the grave of, of friends. Notice this text in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. God is aware even when a little sparrow dies, even when a, when a deer is hit by a car, God is keenly, somehow acutely aware of all pain and suffering. Years ago, I read a book by C.S. Lewis titled The Problem of Pain, and I I was deeply moved and challenged and blessed by that book. And there's even a chapter in that book that I found particularly persuasive, and it's titled On Animal Pain. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. God is aware of the pain even that so-called dumb animals experience? Two days ago, I was sitting in uh, John's class. I went over and and sat in one of his excellent classes there at seminary, and, and he was teaching in part through the book of Jonah. And I don't know if you've read the book of Jonah recently, but it has this really weird ending where, where Jonah is upset that a plant has withered and God says to him, hey man, is it really right for you to be upset? I mean, you after all want me to, you know, destroy Nineveh. And then he says this fascinating thing, and this is how the book of Jonah ends, that has 120,000 people in it who don't know their right hand from their left, and there's a lot of cows there. You don't believe me? Look it up. That's how the book of Jonah ends. God's like, but what about the cows? <laughs> and all the meat eaters are like, oh, snap. <laughs> God cares about cows. Indeed. Here's something I want you to see. Just a quick survey of the point that the gospel writers drive at over and over and over again. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, Jesus must suffer many things. 17, 12, the Son of Man is to suffer. Luke 17, 24 and 40, uh, 25, the Son of Man must suffer. 21, 22, 15, I desire to eat with you before I suffer. 24, 26, ought not the Christ to have suffered. 24, 46, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. Transitioning to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3, verse 18, the Christ would suffer. Acts 17, 3, the Christ had to suffer. Hebrews 2, 18, he himself has suffered. Hebrews 5, 8, though he was a son, yet he suffered. Hebrews 13, verse 12, Jesus suffered. 1 Peter 2, 21, Christ suffered for us. And finally, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Christ suffered for sins. Beloved, it is inescapable that Scripture is at least advocating, it is, it is saying over and again in an inescapable way that in some significant and meaningful sense, God suffers not only in the incarnation, but God suffers as God. Friends, if God can suffer, God can be trusted. I want to say that again. 
A God that can suffer is a God that can be trusted. And think about it this way. Not only did God suffer in, in his divinity insofar as it was possible, as Dr. Peckham communicated, for him to enter into, to, to align his interests with our own, but God actually entered into a situation, and this is where we're going to get to in just a moment, where he actually turned the volume up on his capacity to suffer by becoming a man. The author of Hebrews says, well, actually, that's the reason that he became a man was so that he could suffer and taste death for every man. So not only is God not immune to suffering, he says, how much suffering do I have to go through in order to make the universe right? And it's right at this point that I want to introduce something that has been transformative to me. It's actually an argument that Lewis makes in the book I just mentioned a moment ago, The Problem of Pain. It's a fairly sophisticated argument, but it is mind-blowingly persuasive in my opinion, and I want you to come with me on this journey. Imagine, if you will, a, a, a waiting room for a doctor's office or a dentist's office, and you are sitting in there with three or four or five other people, and all of you are in pain. Right? This is the scene that Lewis is going to walk us through. He says, we must never make the problem of pain worse than it is by this vague talk about the, quote, unimaginable sum of human misery. And we sometimes talk like that. Well, what do you mean, Lewis? Suppose that I have a toothache. You're, there you are sitting in the waiting room of the dentist's office, getting ready to be seen by the dentist. He says, suppose I have a toothache of intensity X. Right, whatever that pain is that you're experiencing on a scale of 1 to 10, you say, ah, this pain hurts X, right? Whatever that is for you. And then he says, suppose that you are also seated beside me in the waiting room there, and you begin to have a toothache also of intensity X. Okay, so far so good. He says, now you, you might, if you chose to, say that the total amount of pain in the room is 2X. Right? And if there were three people, we could say 3x. And if there were four people, we could say 4x. You see where he's going with this, right? It's sensical. It's logical. But watch the punchline. It's absolutely incredible. He says, but you've got to remember this. No one in that room is suffering 2x. There is no such thing, he says, as a sum of suffering for no one suffers it. Hey, that's a good point, I think. There might be four or five or six X of pain in the room in terms of composite, but I'm not experiencing anything more than X. And you are experiencing X. And you are experiencing X. So far, so good. You with me? Now watch where he goes with this. When we have reached the maximum that a single person can suffer, we have no doubt reached something very horrible and terrible but we have reached all the suffering there ever can be experientially, I'll insert that word, in the universe. The addition, says Lewis, of a million fellow sufferers adds no more pain. And I would give only one corrective to Mr. Lewis. And it was actually one that John pointed out, and I want to read it to you. This is found in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. I think there is a sole exception to Lewis' otherwise excellent point. And as I read through a passage of Scripture that I imagine many of you have heard before and that you will be familiar with, I want you to notice two things as I read through this. I want you to listen, first of all, for the plural pronouns, okay? Us and our. I want you to listen for those plural pronouns. And then I want you to listen, secondarily, for all of the references, and I'll point them out probably as we read, for all of the references to carrying or to a burden or to being loaded down. Here we go. Is there an exception to this idea that people only experience their own pain? Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he will grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or handsomeness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. 
but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, and for the transgression of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He will see his seed and he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. For by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many because he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great and shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his very soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The prophet saw something that he himself probably did not fully understand. Here he sees Isaiah the gospel prophet, the suffering servant, bearing not just his own pain in the singular pain X, but somehow in some supernatural transaction bearing our sins, our transgressions, the weight of our iniquity on his shoulders, his infinitely broad shoulders. God is capable now of experiencing not just X, but a billion X, a billion, billion X. And Clifford Goldstein in his excellent book, God, Goodell, and Grace, articulates this idea so powerfully. He says, though we experience only our own fear, only our own loathing, no one else's. At the cross, Jesus experienced everyone else's. The individual miseries of humanity were one by one by one by one added up, and the gruesome sum fell on him. At the cross, everything noisome and evil that ever rippled through our nerves rippled through his at once. Friends, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane pleading and praying, not once, not twice, but three times, Father, is there any other way? And there's no answer. Father, is there another way? Can we do this in some other way? These are not the cries of a dramatist. These are not the cries of a thespian. These are the cries of a, of a, of a human who is looking and insofar as he was cognizant of his divinity, realizing that the weight of the sin of the world, as Goldstein says, everything noisome and evil was going to be placed upon his shoulders and he could begin to feel in his soul. This is what he said to his disciples. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to the point of of death. He didn't say, I stubbed my toe, my knee's bothering me, and I've got a backache. He said, my soul is dying. Friends, God is not only cognizant of the sparrows that fall to the ground. He not only wept at the tomb of Lazarus. In the incarnation, God's infinitely broad shoulders took upon all of the sin that ever had been or would be. This is why Scripture says he could pass over our sins, not because God pulls a fast one, wink, wink, nod, nod, I'll just pretend like that didn't happen, but because God took upon himself the personal responsibility for every sin that ever was committed or would be committed, including yours. God has a legal right to say you are forgiven because that sin that plagues you and bothers you, the sin that causes you shame and guilt, has already been paid for by Jesus. He took ownership of it. Friends, God 
is with us, not in just some generic sense, not just in some platitudinous sense. God is with us not only in our joys, but also in our pain and in our suffering. And a God that can suffer and a God that can feel pain is a God that can be trusted. You can trust God. There in Gethsemane, when when Jesus was finally steeled and strengthened for the task in front of him, and, and the text even intimates, and Ellen White says expressly, that if an angel had not been sent to strengthen him and to buoy him, he would have died in the garden. And yet Jesus somehow manages to stand up and go and face the, the oncoming mob. And just as he's ready to face the mob, Peter, of course, sets out who wasn't willing to spend a moment praying for Jesus. Now he's ready to defend Jesus. And Jesus' response is, Peter, put your sword in its place because all that perish the sword or all that uh, use the sword or take the sword will perish by the sword. There are certain problems that cannot be solved by swords and spears and weaponry. This is a problem that had to be solved in a totally different way. And it's right at this point that we come to what I believe is the, the crowning truth of this idea that God is beautiful and believable both. And Richard Bauckham a Cambridge theologian and author, prolific author, says it this way. He says, when the slaughtered lamb, which is exactly what John the Revelator sees, he looks up and he sees the very throne of God, and when he sees the throne of God, he says, I saw a lamb as if it had been slain on the throne. And this incredible point is made. Look at what Bauckham says. When the slaughtered lamb is seen in the midst of the divine throne in heaven... The meaning of that can only be that Christ's sacrificial death belongs to the way that God rules the world. Now let's just think that through for a moment. What did it mean, as we learned yesterday, to be crucified? It meant humiliation. It meant uh, vulnerability. It meant nakedness. It meant dishonor. It meant shame. And God takes all of that upon himself, not because he deserves it, Paul would say it this way, for he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me translate that for you. Was Jesus a sinner? Was he treated like a sinner? Okay, that being the case then, the sin that condemned Jesus belonged to him just as much as the righteousness that saves you belongs to you. So are you comfortable with calling Jesus a sinner? No, you are not, but he was treated that way. And the sin that condemned Jesus belonged to him just as much as the righteousness that saves you belongs to you. It wasn't his sin and it's not your righteousness. Amen. When the lamb is seen on the throne slain, it means that God reigns from a position of empathy. God reigns even, could we say it, from a position of vulnerability, of seeming weakness. What is more weak and what is more vulnerable and what is more non-threatening than a lamb? But this isn't just a lamb. This is a lamb as if it had been slain. And so in this incredible inversion of reality, what looks to be the weakest possible thing becomes the strongest and most attractive thing in the universe because this is a war that will not be won by strength or might or power. It will be won not on the strength of God's nature, but on the beauty of his character where people will say, God is beautiful. God is incredible. God is lovable. God is worshipable. By his death on the cross, Jesus has reframed completely what power looks like and what pain feels like. Yes, you're in pain, and yes, there's been suffering. But God knows pain. God knows suffering. And he can be trusted even with the ups and the downs and the tragedies and the vicissitudes and the sickness and the illness and the disappointments of your life, 
God has in Christ reframed what strength looks like. We talked about that last night. Pilate's like, I don't think you know who I am. And Jesus is like, actually, you would have no power if my dad and I hadn't gotten together and given you this power. Completely flipping the script. And Jesus reframes what suffering looks like. Suffering can now have meaning. It can have significance. Not because it doesn't hurt. It hurts. Not because there's not pain. There is pain, but you're going to have pain either way. If the universe is cold and unfeeling and uncharitable, you're still going to be in pain. But if there is a God and he can be trusted and he does feel our pain not only in his divinity, but if he became a man and died on a Roman instrument of torture, your pain is still the same. But now that pain has meaning and a God can help you to walk through and walk with that pain into a bright and beautiful and grand and glorious day into eternity itself. You see, friends, God is not only incredible, he is also credible. He is, say it with me if you would, he is beautiful and believable. He is a God that can be loved. He is a God that can be trusted. He is a God that can be worshiped. And yes, there is a sense in which we have a kind of duty, a kind of obligation as his creator, as his creatures rather, and a kind of responsibility to respond to him. But I think too often in religious circles, and particularly I think in Adventist circles, we overemphasize the obligation part, and we don't say enough about the opportunity part. It's not just that you have to, it's that you get to. You get to serve this kind of a God. What else are you going to do with your life? Nothing's better than that. You cannot even conceive of greater good news than this. Number one, there is a God. And number two, he looks like Jesus. God is beautiful and believable. I want to make an appeal and an invitation. And it is an invitation to respond to the kingship of Jesus in your life. When Jesus was on earth and he used the language of the kingdom, people were confused and befuddled about the language that Jesus used because all of their reference for kingdom were things like Rome, a kingdom that had parameters and boundaries and the stability of which was sustained by metal and swords and spears and strength and soldiers. And, and Jesus said, really, wild things, almost in, impossible to understand things. He said, the kingdom of God is inside of you. The, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Well, no one could conceive of a kingdom like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a man that hid a treasure in a field. And the people listened, but they didn't grasp. They couldn't get their mind around a kingdom that was totally, radically, and fundamentally different but the message that Jesus was sending is this. God's kingdom is found whenever and wherever and in whoever says, Jesus is my king. And so the kingdom of God is now mobile. The kingdom of God can go from here to there. The kingdom of God can be right here in this sanctuary tonight. And the kingdom of God can be in your dorm room tonight. The kingdom of God can be in your house tonight. The kingdom of God can be in your car as you drive home. If Jesus is your king, then the kingdom goes with you. Friends, Jesus alone is worthy. I want to invite you to bow your heads as we pray and make the final appeal. Father in heaven, this week we have gathered, we have listened, we have prayed, we have sung. And Father, you have moved among us. Some have caught just a glimpse. It's been a busy week at school. They heard that it was good, but they made a few of the worships, and others have been here for all of them. But Father, Tonight, you have met with us. We have come face to face with the great truth of the universe. 
that you are a God who is not only capable of suffering in some abstract sense, you are a God who is willing to suffer, who feels our pain and our discouragement, who was willing to be hung on a Roman cross to gain access to us and to finally defeat, defeat the powers of darkness. Father, tonight we have gathered in the Sabbath hours to remind ourselves again in many cases of something that we knew but we needed again to respond. That you are king and you sit on your throne co-reigning with your son Jesus in whose name we pray. But Father, there have been others this week for whom the Spirit has moved in a special way. And the glimmers of the possibility of belief in a God that could be trusted and loved and worshipped have sprung up anew. Father, I have heard stories this week, and you know these stories intimately, of, of those who were raised in and around the language of Christianity, in and around the language and institutions of Christianity. But they have encountered the living Christ. Father, that's what we need. We don't just need these incredible institutions like Andrews University and Pioneer Memorial Church. Those things are great, but Father, we need the living Christ. We need Him in our lives. We need Him in our relationships. We need Him in our hearts. And Father, forgive us where we have been satisfied to relate to you as an abstraction and as an idea. And let's be honest, Father, sometimes even as an inconvenience. Father, we ask for forgiveness for sins that we have committed and sins tragically that we will yet commit. Father, we come to you and we just want to say that you are God and we come on the authority of Scripture that we are your sons and daughters. And we receive that status right now. Father, you are worthy. Jesus is worthy. You are beautiful and believable. We claim the promise, come unto me, all you that labor, and you will give rest. What better hours to have rest in, rest for our souls, than the Sabbath hours? And so, Father, we respond to you right now. We don't just respond to preaching or to the interview or to the music. We respond to Jesus. We respond to you. We love you, but we know that's not the big story, Father. The big story is that you love us, and we want to live in the light of that love from this day forward. In Jesus' name, let all of the people that say Jesus is king Say together, amen and amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus is my king. Jesus is my king. Turn to the person next to you and say, he is worthy.